Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Vladika Blagosovitye. Vladika, dear fathers, dear conference organizers, dear participants, thank you for welcoming me back today. Um, yesterday was, uh, I gave a more, uh, might say, a theological or spiritual talk, and today's talk is a little more about a secular subject, but relating the secular subject to our spiritual life and to, our, to the defense and to the uh, spread of our faith, because, of course, your conference topic is sword and shield of the faith, and I was asked to talk about the use of the Internet, and uh, which is, if people, people who know me very well would laugh. They'd find it very ironic, because I'm a total, uh, I'm a technological troglodyte. Um, if I can make a living with a fountain pen and a typewriter and scratch paper, I'd love to do that. If I never saw, a I'll tell you the three things I hate most in the world. Computers, cell phones, and automobiles. <laughs> I would say airplanes, but I don't fly those that often. But air, so so I, am, I am a Luddite. So I'm the worst person in the world to talk about technology, qua technology. However, I guess I'm a good person to talk about it since I am a non-technical person. And, uh, but I, I, I've been forced to use the internet. And it, it's become ironic to me that to a small circle of people, I've become kind of an internet personality, which is very, very funny. Um, but I, I, I do have some thoughts about the internet. And, uh, of course, it's something we have to talk about, because the internet has now become our alternate universe. People, to a great extent today, live in the internet. It's like they, they leave their, their, their body is here, you know, sitting in, you're sitting in your house, there's your body, but your soul is wandering in this vast virtual universe of unknown promises and perils. So the title of my talk is The Internet Perils and Promises. So, of course, we know that we can use the Internet as a sword to advance our faith, a, a proactive a, a weapon. We know that we, we know there's so many now, there are beautiful Orthodox websites with wonderful articles, wonderful videos, and, and people have come, even though I'm such, I have to admit that even though I hate technology, and I hate computers, and I hate hearing my own voice on the internet, much seeing my own face on the internet. I have to admit that I've met people who've actually come to orthodoxy uh, listening to my talks on the internet. So I guess God uses even the very worst things to advance the holy faith. So God, God can take things that people invented for evil and turn them to good. And if you know the story of the internet, it was invented for evil. It was invented for evil. Um, there's a, if you're interested, there's a video called The Net, The Net, the German is Das Netz, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, very interesting YouTube video, it's made back in 2003 by a German artist who became interested in the story of the Unabomber, now, none of you are old enough, well, we're up here, we're old enough, but you young folks are not old enough to remember the Unabomber, a, a brilliant man named Ted Kaczynski, who is a, a, a Harvard graduate, MIT graduate, Stanford professor who went nuts and started mailing pipe bombs to airline executives and computer geniuses because he, he, fl he flipped and became obsessed with the idea of stopping technology. And so this German artist heard about this story and uh, the German artist was not a conspiracy theorist or a, a, a political guy. He was just this, uh, uh, a regular fellow who got interested in this story. So how'd this happen? And how'd, that, how'd this wonderful young man with all his future ahead of him ruin his life like this and kill these people? And so he came to the United States and he started interviewing people. And back in 2003, there were still a lot of people still running around who were involved in the 1960s drug culture and the early days of high tech. And what he found out is that the people who engineered high tech were the same ones who had engineered the drug culture. The, the, the drug and rock culture of 60s America was a government agency operation. There's no doubt about it. And, and the same people who were involved in that also created the Internet. And they were working for DARPA, for an agency, uh, the, dark, the dark research agency of the U.S. government. Right? So the, Internet, the origins of the Internet are sinister. Right? But it's become a tool that everybody's using, but it's become more than a tool. It's become an alternate universe for people. And this is where the dangers come in. If you start living, living in the Internet, right? If you start living inside of it instead of using it as a tool. 
So that's the, so, so these are the two models of what the internet is. Is the internet a tool that I'm using to find information, to, to research a paper I'm writing, to um, communicate to, with someone I need to talk, really talk to? Or is it a, an escape into an alternate universe where I actually live my life? Okay. So I'm living, I'm physically here, but I'm mentally and spiritually roaming around in this unknown, this universe full of unknown, uh, all these doors, right, like a, like a giant castle with all these doors. And you never know, what, when you open it, you never know what's going to come out or, or what it's going to do to you, right? So one message is that it's very important to be very careful about how you use the Internet. Of course, everybody knows that, right? That's a, that's a platitude almost. So we have to, I'm going to give you some more concrete ideas about that later on. So my primary, uh, the, so the, as you can tell, the focus of my talk is not going to be in how we're going to use the Internet to spread the faith. Because it's already obvious how we can do that. We, there are already so many beautiful Orthodox websites. There are, there are beautiful, uh, wonderful, people doing a wonderful job on the Internet of pr promote, you know, lectures, chant, videos, it's all out there. There's, there's so much information about orthodoxy on the internet that you could spend your whole life looking at videos and reading lectures and reading you know, books online about orthodoxy. That it's being done. That's happening. The hard, for us true orthodox, the important thing is discriminating who, who these sources are, what their angle is. right? And on, with that, you have to casually go back to your priest, go back to your spiritual father, go back to experts you trust and say, now, here's a beautiful website and it's so wonderful about orthodoxy, but then they're saying, well, don't join that group that's against the Moscow Patriarchate. They're schismatics. See, whereas they give you a lot of the good stuff, then the bottom line is, don't join Vodik Andranik's church. See, or don't join the Gregor Calendarists. Yeah, so, so you have to be careful. You know, you have to separate the good from the bad. You have to learn discrimination of what you're reading. But insofar as the tool is concerned, if any of you are good at web design, if any of you are good at marketing, go to your priest. Go to your bishop, go to your conference organizers and say, I want to help our church set up a really effective site. Where it's, uh, where it's, it's, it, how, how, how to do this is known. And there, I'm sure, I'm sure I, there are at least a dozen of you here that would know much better than I do how to set up such things. Okay. So, so go, go to your parents, go to your priest, go to your bishop and say, I want to help set up a really good, I want to really work on the, on the diocese website. Or I really want to set up this kind of a resource for our church to, to promote our message. And they can, it can be done. It's a great tool to do that. And um, so please, you know, remember yesterday I was talking about the fact that we all have to be warriors, right? We have to, everybody here should be militant. Everybody here should be, you consider yourself, I'm signed up, I'm a warrior for Christ, I'm going to fight for my church. And if you're good with the internet, and you know how to do that, and you go to your bishop, go to your priest, and you volunteer and say, we're going to do a fantastic website, or a blog, or a YouTube channel, or whatever it takes to get our message out. And I'm going to help do that. Okay? That can be done. So that is, that's, it's well known now how to do that. And I don't, think, I, I, don't need, I don't think I have to tell you how to do that. A lot of you in this room may know better than I do <laughs> how, that's, how that can be done. All right. What I can do is um, more effectively, perhaps, so I could, how I thought I'd spend my time today, is cautioning about the dangers of the wrong use of the Internet. Because remember, what, what, what was the theme of my talk yesterday? It was about preserving the soul, preserving the, the innermost treasure of your soul. Right? And just whatever you do, don't lose your soul. It's the only soul you have. Right? And so easy for our soul to be just sucked out of us, right? Just, just sucked out of us. You, can, you, go in the, you, you, go, you start surfing in the internet or you start getting lost in some stupid argument on your Facebook page. And it's hours later and you realize, what have I done? Man, I, I wasted precious hours of my life doing something stupid. Okay? So we, we know that can be done, right? It's like, it's like the, that machine sucking your soul out of your body, sucking your mind out <coughs> and, and fragmenting up and mashing it up. And, and, and handing it back to you on a plate, like you know, mashed potatoes. You know, your, your mind becomes just so fragmented. 
And fragmentation of the mind is what happened to our first parents when they fell. Remember I talked yesterday about the noose, the noetic intellect? That was the, the, the pure mirror of God's truth that the human mind was created to be. And it's, it's an integrated, unified mind that is beautifully open to truth, both divine truth and natural truth, human truth. And then, but what, what sin does and what distraction does is it fragments the mind. Think of the, your original mind as a beautiful mirror to, to reflect back God's truth. Then what sin does and what distraction does, it takes the mirror and smashes it into a million pieces. And each of those pieces is reflecting a fragment of the reality. But it's not the reality. It's a fragment. And people get obsessed with fragments. A lot of mental illness and spiritual illness is being obsessed with a fragment of reality. What makes the fragment dangerous is that it is something real. That fragment is a part of reality. But it's just a part of it because it's, it becomes compelling and you get obsessed with it. It's like people get obsessed, you know, on the entertainment world, they're obsessed with this entertainer, the singer or an actor, right? In the political world, they're obsessed with this blogger and all of his opinions are the truth. And if you disagree with my favorite blogger, you're evil and uh, I'm going to cast you out, you know. And um, we do that with our faith. You know, that's how a lot of heresies got started. Schisms get started. Uh, personality cults get started within orthodoxy because people zero in on a fragment and they lose, they, they lose sight of the whole picture. Remember, orthodoxy is always the whole picture. Orthodoxy is the whole picture of reality. So what happens, but the Internet is, a, is a, even more powerful than books, right? Because you can, for a book, you've got to work to read a book. You go to the library, you pull it off the shelf. You put it down, you open it up, and you start reading it. All right? And then to read a different viewpoint, you have to close that book, put it back on the shelf, go get another book, pull it out. You have to spend time. But the Internet, you can be going bam, bam, bam. You're clicking on one view after another. And, and um, after an hour or so, it's like the Greeks say, anapoda, your feet are up in the air. You're so, you're so disoriented, you see. And so you're really, you really haven't learned anything. You haven't advanced. You may have gotten a lot of data. Remember yesterday I was talking about the difference between data and the interpretation of the data. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a big mistake of modern culture to think that the more data you have, the better. Because data, data, data by itself is just stuff. Right? It, it doesn't interpret, it, data does not interpret itself. Right? It does not interpret itself. Okay? You have to have a unified, focused, prayerful, educated mind. And you have to have counsel from others who are wise to interpret the information that's coming to you. So don't get lost on the internet all day long. Say, oh, Father, I just learned that so-and-so is a heretic and you shouldn't be serving with him. How many, how many crazy schisms get started because somebody read an article by cer a certain person I once knew in Colorado who has a whole website attacking every synod in existence. And uh, they, they decide their bishop's no good or something like that. Or they decide their friend down the streets outside the church, right? Because they just read one article. Or they saw a video. We even more saw a video about it, right? Or read a soundbite about it on somebody's Facebook page. So we have to be careful because the, the nature of the Internet is that it, 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 there's so much, you can get so much at once, right? So there are several things dangerous about the Internet. One is, just what I've just said, the rapidity, the rapidity with which you can um, access so much data at one time and, and differing viewpoints at one time until your head's spinning, okay? So, so, so it's the, the data overload and the rapidity with which you, you get all this new data. And another thing is just the pure distraction. We know about the distraction problem, the attention span problem, right? So the TV age really destroyed attention span. Now, the Internet age has put that destruction in, into a new quantum level of destruction of, of, of the attention span. So we have to, if we're going to be spirit, or if we're going to be mature thinking people, much less spiritual people, we have to work on attention, Having attention. The, whole, the Holy Father is constantly talking about attention. Right? Our whole spiritual life is about attention. Paying attention to the thoughts. The, in, in Greek we say, logis me. It's just misli. And our misli, our, our thoughts. Right? We're paying attention to our thoughts. And, 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 and if you're constantly distracted by entertainment or arguments or socializing on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, or whatever uh, all those things right, are just constantly on your phone texting somebody. I've got to know what you're having for dinner tonight. Why? Like, who cares? Right? Um, I'm, I'm going to report to you. you know, I just came out of a class, and this is what, you know, and, well, you know, the constant rep reportage to the whole world about 
you know, your daily life because uh, you've just got a text, right? Because the, 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 um, the technology itself is addicting. And it's made to be addicting. Okay. One of the original designers of Facebook who got disgusted with it and he broke with, uh, what's your name, Zuckerberg. What's his name? Mark. Yeah, Mr. Zuckerberg, the good, uh, good Scottish boy. Um, he, um, <clears throat> he, uh, Scottish, you know, Scottish. They, uh, they're cheap and uh, they, um, never mind. Um, so Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Zucker, he broke Mr. Zuckerberg because he said, he said, I was a prostitute. I designed Facebook after I studied the psychology of Las Vegas and how to get people addicted to slot machines. Okay. Okay. That's, you have to realize, like when I said there's a lot of sinister stuff behind it, I'm not saying never use the internet again. We can't, we have, unless we're going to become, I guess, Amish or old believers or something, we're going to be using the internet. The question is to real, be realistic about where it comes from and, and what kind of dangers are built into it. Just from the get-go, just from the the, the, the the substructure of the whole thing. Okay. So just be very careful. It's going to it's addictive, right? We know that. We know we, internet or your 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 smartphone. Does anybody here not have a smartphone? <laughs> you know what? I, I lost I lost my flip phone a couple of months ago. And I said, uh, I guess I'll break down and get a smartphone. And I've got it. I'm so disgusted with it. I'm going to go back to a flip phone. I just found my flip phone. It was under the seat of my car. <laughs> and it still has the SIM card in it, so I'm going to go back to my flip phone. Um, and, but I, I don't even use this for the Internet. I still, haven't, I still have not hooked on the Internet on this thing. I've used it for a phone. I, I, mean, I don't even like that. But uh, well, that's another. we're going to get to smartphones later. But, uh, so the Internet, so let's watch out for several things. I'm going to get, at the end, I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking about general insights now. At the end, I'm going to give you some to, a to-do list, how to deal with some of these things, okay? So we want to be practical and just say, this is what we can, we can do about it, okay? I'm not just going to leave you hanging like, oh, no, I'm doomed. I look at the Internet, I'm doomed. Um, no, there are things we can do to use it intelligently. So I want to g- give you some, uh, just a, well, to reiterate, I want to emphasize that we should think of the Internet as a tool, not our universe. Okay. This is the real universe. Isn't this wonderful? We're sitting in a room, a real room. Our feet are on this real wood. Icons in front of us. Our bishops here. Our priests are here. We're all here. And I don't, I'm, I'm not doing, we're not doing a video chat, right? I'm not using high tech at all. I'm just, well, except for this digital recorder. But even this is, this is a... Uh, Stone Age, right? This sort of thing. <laughs> now, it seems quaint, doesn't it? It seems almost, almost uh, poignant. Um, uh, this little old-fashioned digital recorder. Um, but, you know, we're, we're having a real experience now. This is the real world, you know. And one of the fundamental differences between Christi- the Christian revelation and Eastern religions and Platonic philosophy is that in the Bible, God reveals to us that this world is real and it's good. This world is real, and it's good. God made it, and he said it's good. Whereas in Eastern philosophies, Eastern religion, this world is maya. It's a, that's the Sanskrit word, maya. Illusion. It's illusion, right? And there's, a, there's a, a, spiritual, a pure spiritual world you have to escape to, right? And the body's evil, and material things are evil, and you just have to, you know, through, through uh, ascetical practice or through true philosophy, your soul escapes back to the world of the forms in Plato, are to, to nirvana in Hinduism and so forth and so on. But we don't believe in that. We know better. God's revealed to us through Moses in the first chapter of Genesis that this world is real and it's good. And God became a human being with a real body. That's the foundation of our faith. So, so this, first of all, this world is good. And it's the real world. Because we know the visible universe is only part of the real world. As we were saying yesterday, there's the invisible universe, of course which our souls, is part of, uh, our souls are part of that, but we relate to the invisible universe to a great extent through the visible universe. We have holy sacraments. We receive holy communion this morning. Right? We're, we're accessing that invisible universe through, through the physical, you know, because our faith is based on the incarnation of our Lord. And, and, and uh, so this world is good, and it's real, and it's important to do. At the end of the day, you know, here, do an experiment. At the end of the day, how many real things did I do? Like, things with basic, how many real things did I do? 
how many basic things did I do? Did I, did, I mean, in the physical universe, and how much time did I spend in the virtual universe? Actually, keep a log. How many times do I look at my smartphone? How many times do I check my Facebook or my or email or Twitter or, or whatever? And how, many, how, how much time did I spend actually um, talking to somebody face-to-face, -face, a real person? Right. Uh, how much time did I spend doing a, 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 a craft or growing a garden or taking a walk or just sitting down with my family and telling a story or just using low-tech you know, taking a photograph with a camera instead of, you know, instead of 10 million photographs with my smartphone. Um, you know, just how much time am I spending with more old-fashioned ways of human functioning, just human activity? And actually keep a log, you know. Try this experiment. I'm getting, I got a paper from school. Now, this is going to sound radical. I don't want, you know, let's get rid of the smelling salts if anybody faints. Um, it's a radical. I get a paper for school. And I say, you know what? I heard that my great-great-grandfather once went to the library and pulled books out to do papers. <laughs> I'm going to try an experiment. Now, it's kind of radical. Maybe just, I'll just one day, I'm going to go to the library. I'm not going to look at the Internet at all. I'm going to learn. Of course, I have to use uh, all the card catalogs are on digital now. I will have to do, use that. So I'll go to the card, the, what we, I'm, I'm dating myself, the card catalog. I'm going to go to the, the online catalog in the library, but I'm going to look at and I'm going to go to the librarian and say, where can I find this book on the shelf? And, uh, and I'm going to find a book and open a book and, get, and sit at a desk and have a pile of books in front of me, and that's going to do my paper. And maybe a teacher, if you go to a teacher and say, that's how I'm going to do it, maybe you could talk to the teacher into giving you bonus points. <laughs> that's just an idea. That is one example of, of a radical retro approach to a simple task just to get a feel of what it's like not to do something using the internet, right? It's the, that, and, and, you know, books, once, you, once you're in the world of books, it's very comforting. You know, just try sitting. Do any of you have parents or grandparents who just have a, 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 a library, a room that's lined with books, maybe with a fireplace? Just go sit, just go sit in that room. Don't, don't even read the books. Just sit in the room and feel the books. Feel the good, the, the good feel of the books. Right? It's, it's comforting, right? It's something stable. It's not changing every two seconds. Right? And um, so one thing, that, that leads me to another point. So one thing is keep a log of your day and see how much time you're spending on screens when, that you don't need to spend. It's understandable that if, for our jobs or for school, we may be forced to be X amount of hours on the Internet. That's n no question about that. And that, that's just part of life today. Although I would encourage you, and especially you young men, to get skilled trades where you do real stuff like welding or carpentry or bricklaying, or farming, you know, working with your bodies and, and doing r real physical skills, not just saying, well, I'll make my living on the computer all my life. Because what if they pull the plug in the computers? I mean, what if, <laughs> what if you know, that's, it's so easy to push a button now and just, you know, make it all disappear. So um, we should be acquiring real skills and we should, and uh, in one thing, real skills, you know, and domestic skills, cooking, uh, taking care of a home, you know, old-fashioned medicine. Uh, I, I'm very proud of her. We have an eight-year-old granddaughter. She wants to be an herbalist. And uh, her, their parents don't let them do much screen stuff. They kick them out of the house. And I'll, I'll, go, to my, I'll go to my son's house, and my granddaughter will grab something out of the, out of, off the lawn, some flower off the lawn, and say, here, granddaddy, eat this. I said, what? <laughs> eat this. You sure? Look, we'll eat it. They eat it. You know, because yeah, they're studying their herbal books, their herbalism, their herbalist books, right? So they're learning. So I realized, wait, my eight-year-old, if, if there was a food shortage, my eight-year-old could survive because she would know. And I couldn't because I wouldn't know what to eat. You see? So, so our, our daughter-in-law is very good about that. She's forced him to do real things, you see? So acquiring skills like that, Real skills, getting back in touch with, with God's creation, with handicrafts, traditional crafts, traditional skills, and, and old-fashioned tech. Learn how to fix a car. Of course, now they're making it so difficult to fix cars. You have to be a computer genius how to fix cars. But as long as they're letting us use gasoline, get an old gas burner and learn how to fix a car. And, um, yeah, so, um, and talk to Mr. Nick Buzilovich about going back to the land. 
Yeah. And he'll, he'll give you, he can give you, you should have a whole conference on going back to the land. So, um, and then to get back to that other idea I had, one day just keep track of all the things you have to do on the internet and things where you don't really need to spend time on it. And keep track of how much time you wasted time on it and, when, and how much time you did something real. When's the last time I just sat down and talked to my parents or my friends? When's the last time I just went out and took a walk, took a hike? You know, when's the last time I made something with my hands? You know, just keep, it's a reality check. Just to, be, you know, just to realize how much time we're spending doing real things as opposed to a virtual life. Okay. Now, so we probably, we're, we're, I'm sure we're all familiar with the movie The Matrix, right? It's, by now it's an old movie, right? Um, because I think of it as a very recent movie. Uh, but so the idea of the Matrix, of course, is that this future dy dystopic universe uh, in which the machines have taken over and the human beings are just energy sources, right? The, the, the human beings are batteries for the machines and they're plugged in and the human beings are just like this in cocoons. But, but to keep them happy, the machines project a false universe into their brains. Right? So they imagine they're walking down the street. They imagine they're walking down Fifth Avenue, New York. They imagine they're having a nice meal in a restaurant. They imagine they're having a date, and, um, but it's all fake, right? And then the hero somehow realizes this, but he's in the real world. There's this grungy, dark world where the heroes are, like they're in the sewers or they're in some kind of black tunnel where they're fighting the bad guys. But the hero goes back into the Matrix to do the fighting, right, to, to free the people who are in the Matrix, right? So one, one way to look at the Internet, the Internet's the Matrix. You have to go into it to do your work. But remember, it's the matrix. And pull out and spend, uh, spend a critical mass of time necessary in the real universe to uh, unfragment your mind. Okay. So another, another um, tip, don't get rid of your books. I don't know if you have books. I was shocked. Let me, I, I was, to show you how how, what a dinosaur I am. I was absolutely shocked when uh, our, one of our, our uh, Matushka, uh, our Pesitera, the, the other Pesitera at my P Creek Parish, um, is a physician, and she's a medical school professor. And she walked into a class, and she said, and she looked in, and the, the, the um, textbooks were predetermined by the administration. She didn't get to choose the materials. She just walked in, said, okay, open your books. She looked in and said, doctor, we don't have books. Like, what do you have? Well, our other professors do PowerPoints. Those are our doctors of the future. Okay. So I, can't, I don't take for granted that people have books anymore, but if you have books, keep them. Don't throw out your books. I guess everybody's heard of Tucker Carlson, right? Yes. I'm not here to promote Tucker Carlson one way or the other. I'm just saying that he gave a speech to the Heritage Foundation uh, uh, like the day before they fired him at Fox News. And he was talking about, he was just opening up and being himself. And he said two things. He said, he said, pray 10 minutes a day for our country. And he said, don't get rid of your books. Don't get rid of your books. Okay. Well, that's Tucker Carlson. Even he, I mean, he's, he admits he's a you know, squishy, half-unbelieving Anglican. You know, and he, he knows that. right? So don't get rid of your books. Because a, a book has a different character. Now, I'm going to get on the subject of books in particular. I have a, a parishioner. He's an elderly man. He's a remarkable person. I have these two parishioners. They're, they're in their 80s. They were, they were super zealous Roman Catholics until they were in their late 70s. They had 14 children. Three of them are Roman Catholic nuns. Um, and, and, and they were very active in Catholic traditionalism, you know, fighting the new mass, fighting you know, all the changes in the Catholic Church. And then they came to Orthodoxy in their 70s. These are really remarkable people. And we baptized them in their late 70s to orthodoxy. And the husband's still a remarkable man. He's still very active for an 80-ish person. And he told me a story about his early married days. He said, yeah, he said, when I was a young married guy, he was a young married guy in the early 70s. When I was a young married guy, I thought, I want to be successful. I want to know what's going on. So I, I subscribed to the Wall Street Journal. And I was going to read the Wall Street Journal every day to know what was going on. And he said, I found that I, the more I read, the more depressed I got. He says, because I noticed things were always changing, and there's always bad news. They're always predicting bad things about to happen. And then they didn't happen, but I was always waiting for the next bad thing to happen. So he said, 
I got depressed and, and it said it didn't help me at all. So I stopped my subscriptions. I didn't read newspapers at all anymore. I just read books. And I got out books about history and about religion and about politics. And I just started reading books. And it said, he said, I got, became much more peaceful, he said. And the reason is that when you're forced to read a book, you have to sit and really think about it. And you realize that often, the, and the, unlike a newspaper, a good book, an important book, is not talking about something that's transient, come today and gone tomorrow. Right? And that was just newspapers. We're not talking about the internet now, or even radio or television. We're just talking about newspapers. Even the, the newspaper, the addict to the daily, the guy reading it, the actual print newspaper, is getting agitated. Right, because it's being fed something new every, some new disaster every day, some new threat every day, or some new entertainment, or some new titillation every day, and so again, the fr it fragments the mind, and it makes you excited and nervous and irritable, or full of desire, or full of fear, but it's agitating your passions. Whereas a book, even if the book is a bad book, say it's it's Karl Marx, it could be something horrible, but you can, but you know, you've got control over it. You can shut it. It's not addicting. And you open up again and say, well, that's stupid. You know, and, and, I'm gonna, and, I, and, I can, and I can read another book to tell me, explain why it's stupid. But you know what? It doesn't threaten my life today. It's not, it's not exciting. It's not titillating. It's not scary. It's something that's contained. It's contained. It's stable. And you notice that people who spend their time more with books and less with screens, they're calmer and they can think more clearly. So I know it sounds radical. <coughs> But ask yourself, when's, when's the last time you read a print book? And, um, and go, go get a good one and just read it. Of course, yeah, spiritual books, obviously. Um, there's so many beautiful orthodox spiritual books. There are more orthodox, <coughs> as I said yesterday, there are more orthodox books in English now than ever. Beautiful books. Every topic. Dogma, spiritual life, prayer, lives of saints. It's all out there. Print, actual print books. And build an orthodox library. So St. John Chrysostom said that without spiritual reading, we can't be saved. And of course, he, he was talking about scrolls and parchment codices, <laughs> but um, books. Okay, so get books. Build a, a library of real books. Don't say, well, I've got my book, on, I've got my book in my Kindle. I've got my book, in, you know, I, my smartphone can store 10 million terabytes so I can get the entire Library of Alexandria or li <laughs> Library of Congress. I'll get the Library of Congress in my smartphone. <laughs> But um, no, get, get real books because it, it simultaneously is better for your mind. It's even better for your body. You know, now looking at that screen and you've got this physical object. And so many books are actually are objects, older books. Go find old used books. They're, they're objects of beauty. And, um, and just the smell. I guess, I guess I'm weird, but just to me the smell of a book is just great. Like an, an old book. And it just, it's comforting. All right? It's like going to visit grandma. So, um, so it's psychically very healthy, right, to have books. Of course, it, they have to be the right books. I'm not saying go any book. You know, obviously an, or, an orthodox video on YouTube is better than a book by, uh, you know, Anton LaVey of the Church of Satan. I mean, this is, I, I don't have to tell you that. You know, you're, you're grownups. You, you understand that. But, um, but, but books. Don't throw away your books. Um, now, speaking of books, there are three books I want to recommend One's an old book, well, old by today's standards. One is, a, one is an, an orthodox book, and one is a practical book about um, getting unaddicted from um, the digital universe. Okay. There's an old book. It's about TV. There's a lot of the, you know, there was a, people my age remember when the enemy of attention span was not the Internet, it was the television. No. Uh, I'm 65. My generation were the first ones raised on television. That's why we're so messed up. You talk about the people talk about the stupid boomers. You know the whole boomer. Oh, okay, boomer. You know, dumb. You know, why are boomers so dumb? Because they're raised on television. Yeah. That's why our parents are so much smarter than we are. Okay. But they're the ones who they weren't smart enough to avoid television, so they gave us they babysat us with television. So television, the the the, the problems with television, problems with the attention span. The problems with how it wires, rewires the, the, the neural pathways of the brain. The problem with um, uh, so many problems with TV then be, become, get carried over into problems with the Internet. So it's good if you do a little history. And this is ancient history. It's 1970s. 
States. This is ancient history. Back in the 1970s. And there's a book by a leftist, atheist Jew. That's a very good book. To show how, <laughs> how diverse I am, right? I'm, I'm tolerant. Uh, the guy's name, believe it or not, his name is Jerry Mander. No. And his name is Jerry Mander. <laughs> but Jerry with a J. Jerry Mander is a, was a leftist, atheist Jew who nevertheless, you know, you know how a broken clock is right twice a day? Well, an analog clock. Yeah. I'm dating myself now. A broken clock, you know, the clocks with the, with the hands and the, the faces. A broken clock right, is right twice a day. So this broken clock, the, the atheist, leftist, activist Jew, Jerry Mander, wrote a very good book called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. Now, I'm going to... I'm, yeah, y'all can look that up. I'm looking it up right now. See, she's using the internet. No, 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 it's a good I'm, use of the internet. I'm writing it down. Uh, oh, oh, that's right. You can write. You can write, uh, you can. You actually, you can take notes with that too. I forgot. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, this will be on the recording, and one of us has a post Lushania to transcribe my talks. So, uh, um, so uh, you don't have to memorize. Although, if you if you want to memorize what I'm saying, please do. Memorization is very important too. Um, that's a whole other topic we could talk about. So four arguments for the nation of television. Now remember, he's got his viewpoint. So when he says, it, like one of his points is, it, uh, it discourages traditional religion because people, TV, the TV generation doesn't understand complex rituals. But his example of a complex ritual is some kind of an American Indian uh, uh, sweat bath ritual or something, you know, some goofy leftist obsession with, with the aboriginal demonism. Um, but so you just have to filter out his his biases, but his basic insights into what's wrong with the technology are, are very accurate. There's a landmark book. It made somewhat of a splash. Unfortunately, not enough people listened to him. But so four arguments for the mission of television. Go back and do, so that's a little history lesson. Well, what people already saw was wrong with TV back in the 70s. All right. Now let's move forward to our own time. And there's an important Orthodox book. Where's an Orthodox book? that relates the, the, the perils of media addiction, whether uh, internet you know, news feeds or social media, whatever, or just staring at your iPhone um, uh, for no reason whatsoever. Um, it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a Frenchman named Jean-Claude Lachet. Lachet, L-A-R-C-H-E-T. Jean-Claude Lachet. You should invite him to let's listen to something. He's been to Lesna, bravo. So you, could, you can ask Matushka about <coughs> Dr. Larchet. Dr. Larchet is one of the foremost uh, patristic scholars of our time. And he's also, he wrote a book called The New Media Epidemic, The Undermining of Society, Family, and Our Own Soul. So you think I'm radical? The Undermining of Society, Family, and Our Own Soul. Okay. He's not in our church. He's a layman in, I think, the Ecumenical Patriarchate or... Uh, Ruda Ru Church, or something like that. Um, but but this, it's, a, it's a very important book. So this is your orthodox book. Okay, so Jerry Mander is just the historical critique of TV by a non-Christian. Okay. Dr. Larcher is a specifically patristic book. He's also he's a physician and he's a psychiatrist, I think. I believe so. Yeah. It's so, a very important book on orthodox psychiatry. Very important book. He's got the, a four-volume manium opus on the passions. Mm. It's a very, one of the best book, one of the best recent books about uh, patristic psychology. Um, but this is his book on the media epidemic. Okay? And then there's a practical book. So, okay, that's fine. Okay, I've read, I've read Mander, I've read Larche, I've read Dr. Larche, I realize that the Holy Fathers um, have this to say about the soul, and I'm hurting my soul. What do I do about it? I'm, I mean, the, the, I'm drowning in the internet. I mean, I, I, I'm doing my schoolwork on it. I'm talking to my friends on it. I'm we're getting news from it. You know, I can't just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not going to move to a cave somewhere and just have no Wi-Fi or and no smartphone. Although, try it. I mean, if someone here wants to try that, come back and tell us. You know, but, there, but it is possible to, minim, to minimize, to cut back on our use of the internet, or to, to avoid extreme addiction to um, the internet. So there's a book... This man, and now this is not from an orthodox viewpoint, it's from a, a psychosocial viewpoint, but it's a very practical, very practical book. Very practical book. The man's name is Cal 
Newport, just the way it sounds, Cal Newport, American guy. It's called Digital Minimalism. Digital Minimalism. And he has a plan for how to cut back on the amount of time you spend on screens and internet and smartphones. And, and um, it's a practical plan. Now, he's someone who's making his living on the internet. Okay? And, and I've got an article here. I printed out an article by a lady named Ruth Gaskowski, who, but is, who's not, maybe she's Polish, I don't know, she's not Orthodox, because um, there's one place where she says, she brings up our, our exorcisms at baptism and, and spitting on Satan. And she calls it a weird ritual. But she, she's actually looking at it favorably, but she thinks it's weird. So you have to overlook that little irreverence because she's not Orthodox. But Ruth Gaskowski here is, this is an article called from feeding Moloch to digital minimalism. Of course, Moloch was the ancient god they sacrificed babies to, right? So she's saying we're sacrificing our ch Did you want to ask something? Don't the Templars worship, well, like, weren't they very involved with the occult? I thought that was what they... No, the, 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 that's another big subject. We can talk about... What? We can have a whole lecture on the medieval crusading orders, right, and the, the occult background of those things. But, um, but Moloch is this ancient god that they sacrifice babies to. So what she's saying is we're sacrificing our younger generation by just handing them over to, 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 to digital tech, right? The, the, you know, my parents used the TV as a babysitter. Now parents are using the internet, right? And smartphones as the babysitter. They're sacrificing their children's minds and souls to Moloch. Okay? And believe me, Mark Zuckerberg is Moloch. Um, he's not the only one. He's just an example, right? There's, there, there are plenty more of them. So um, Ruth... But this Ruth Gaskowski, at the end of her article, she summarizes Cal Newport's plan. Uh, so this is an article. It's on a site called, um, it's on a Substack site called School of the Unconformed. <laughs> that's, I guess that's her Substack, School of the Unconformed. And it's an article called um, From Feeding Moloch to Digital Minimalism. And at the end, she, she summarizes Cal Newport's book, or his plan, or... Um, getting unaddicted from your, your media. Okay. So one last topic I want to address is what about my social life? So I'm isolated. Okay. My, my parents made this good choice. They're not going to be in world orthodoxy. They're in this isolated Russian group where they, they pray to the czar and, and they, um, they're on this old calendar and, and they're not even communing with the Russian church down the street. That's also on the old calendar. <laughs> okay, that's how isolated we are, and maybe we have to drive three hours to go to church, or we don't all, we don't have a priest every week. Okay, and I don't have that many friends because I'm my family's so weird, you know. I, I don't have any, so I got I've got to talk to my friends who are in my church. They're scattered all over North America, or they're in Russia, or they're in Serbia, and we're using the internet as a tool to talk to each other, and that's important. I'm not denying the importance of that. I know. I mean, as I said earlier. We have people in our, in our GOC parishes now, there are whole families who have come to our GOC parishes and been baptized because they, they listen to my talks on the Internet. So who am I to knock the Internet? Right? So, and, I, and also I, I realize that people are lonely. And sometimes it's not just a fake Facebook friend. You know, they, of course, they destroyed the word, right? Friend is now a meaningless word because of Facebook's redefined friend. But there are people who have real friends real friends, and somehow they never met them, but their souls communicate because they share the same faith, they think the same way, and they're talking, but this, my friend might live in Russia, my friend might live in Serbia, or, my, or I'm in New York, my friend lives in California. And we really, we use video chat, and we use messaging and so forth, um, or maybe, or texting, although texting, I don't know how people can spend their lives texting, that, that makes me, that would make me crazy, but, um, to, but they're using, they're using the internet and they're using cell phones to really communicate. I'm not knocking that and I, I'm, not, I'm not denigrating that. Just saying that, um, think about, as you're, you're, you're young adults, God, God willing, uh, some of you will be monastics someday. That'll really, if you have a good abbot or abbess, you'll get cured of the internet really fast. Okay? That'll be taken care of. Right, Matryoshka? It's a problem. We hope. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's the theory. I could, I could do a whole lecture on how the internet has 
affected masochism. Well, I was, I was so shocked when I found out that they were letting monks on Athos have cell phones. I was blown away. I said, is it really the end of the world? You know. Anyway, so that's still, but we hope if you're in a real, in a good monastery, you know, then Matia Fresenia, if you're a young lady who joins Lesna, she will come and she will take your smartphone and throw it in the trash. Right, Matryoshka? Um, yes, yes. Uh, or go to Serbia and go to Vlika Kakia, and he will, um, Vlika Kakia has a phone this big. His phone is this big. It's beyond flip phone. It's like a, a mini, it's like a pygmy phone. That's because he has Mati Catherine there. Yeah, mother, well, he, yes, uh, I don't want to get to Catherine. <laughs> she's, she's a work in progress. Um, but she's the only one who has the obedience, though, to do that. The others don't. The others don't. So, um, or, or you may be married. You know, the more, more probably will be, we hope, will, will be married. I, mean, I don't mean, I hope more will be married than be monks. I, mean, I hope some of you, you know, that, that the, those of you who don't become monastics will find good spouses, start orthodox families. As you're starting your family, lay a good foundation for your family where you're saying, we're not, I'm not going to take for granted that my children are just going to be on screens all the time. I don't, my eight-year-old does not need a smartphone. You know, and uh, I, I'm telling you, I'm devastated. I, I, I want to go up to people. I just want, I, don't, I want to go up to total strangers in a coffee shop and say, what are you doing to your child? But I see, I go in a coffee shop, and there's a young mom over there. She's like a, a sweet-looking girl, right? Like, young, wholesome, probably thinks of herself as, you know, Republican conservative mom, you know, kind of person. Uh, the kind of person who wants to be a, a, a Fox News anchor or something like that. And, um, and she's got her little child there on a device staring at a video or something so she can drink her latte and text her friends. You know, this is child abuse. This is child abuse. They're rewire, rewiring a preschooler's mind with videos from the internet? That's really wrong. Okay, so don't do that. Don't do that. Spend, you know, so plan ahead. When you, you find your spouse, your future husband or wife, sit down and say, our, we're going to tell our children stories, we're going to read them books, we're going to sing songs, and they're going to do real stuff with us. They're going to plant potatoes and wash dishes. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You know, um, they're going to they're work with, we're going to work with animals. I want, I want, I want my five-year-old to be able to milk a cow. Or hand dad tools when he's fixing the car. You know, real life. So, um, so, Getting back to social life, then, uh, it is true that we have there are friends and family. We need to. I mean, uh, uh, two thirds of my children live in former Yugoslavia, and so I only see one of my grandchildren by looking at videos my daughter sends, right, on, on Messenger. Okay, and we're glad, to, we're we're thankful for that, right. But we have to also focus on the people right in front of us. And as you're planning your family life, saying, you know what, we're going to make a sacrifice and move near one of our churches as much as possible to have a regular church life. So our church life isn't five more minutes. Oh, oppa. I'm being Greek now. Oppa. Um, so in your social life, it's good to have friends, long distance friends on the screens, but it, you have to cultivate real face to face friends. Are there people I could be spending real time with in the physical universe that I haven't reached out to? And made friends. Okay. So to, um, I'm getting the, the word here from, I don't want to transgress the program. So um, remember, let me, some final points. Remember, the internet is not your world. The internet is a tool. It's not a universe. It's not the universe. It's, your t it's a tool. It's not, a tool is something under your control. By definition, a tool is something you control. It doesn't control you. The internet is a tool. It's not my, an alternate universe. Or not the universe I want. It is an alternate universe, but I don't want to be in it all the time. Two, make and carry out a plan for digital minimalism. Cal Newport. Digital minimalism. Three, don't get rid of your books. And if you don't have books, get some. Oh. Uh, and uh, if, if you need a list, I'll ask my son, who's a librarian, to send you a list of the 100 books you need. Um, finally, and prayer, which of course is always the last word, isn't it? That's, priests are so boring. Like, 
Let's get back to prayer. Ask our Lord to enlighten you as to how to use the internet for your salvation and the salvation of your neighbor. Everything is under God's sovereign will. Right? Even the anti the anti tech people who fear the internet. Oh no, the internet's evil. It's the spirit of antichrist or whatever. They're, why are they fearful? Because they've forgotten that God is sovereign over all things. And he uses all things for our salvation. So ask our Lord, seriously, I'm, I'm, get, I'm not being a, I'm not, this is not a pious platitude. This is, this is a very practical reality. Ask our, our divine Savior to enlighten you by his all Holy Spirit, whom we're going to, whose descent we're going to celebrate again in a, in a week. To enlighten you how to use the internet for your salvation and the salvation of your neighbor. And uh, God loves these prayers. God loves it when we ask for good things. He wants to give us good things. So ask, ask the Lord earnestly for that. And um, God will answer your prayer.